Peace be with you. Friends, how often the Bible compels us to meditate on the meaning of faith. We might say that the scriptures rest upon faith. They remain inspired at every turn by the spirit of faith. They're meant to lead us into deeper faith. Okay, but as Paul Tillich, the 20th century theologian said, faith is the most misunderstood word in the religious vocabulary. I've always felt he's right about that, but that's our problem. If the Bible is all about faith and yet people don't understand faith, we got a problem. See, especially in our present cultural context, lots of critics of religion say that faith is just you know, anti-intellectualism. It's, it's settling for easy answers. It's accepting things on the basis of no real evidence, et cetera, et cetera. If you want the details of this, watch any program by Bill Maher, read any book by Christopher Hitchens. You'll find this dismissal of faith over and over again. But as I, I've argued a thousand times, none of this has a thing to do with real faith as the Bible presents it. Real faith is never below reason, it's always above reason and inclusive of it. Does that make sense? What's below reason, that is superstition, that is credulity, that's being childish in your intellectual life, etc. And the church and the Bible stand completely against that. Authentic faith, though, is above reason, beyond it. Well, what is it? What is it? I'd say this. Faith is an attitude of trust in the presence of God. Let me say that again. Faith is an attitude of trust in the presence of God. It's an openness to what God will reveal, what God will do, and what God will invite us to become. Now, I hope it's obvious that in dealing with an infinite, all-powerful person, so in dealing with God, the one thing we can never be is utterly in control. See, that's why we say faith goes beyond reason. See, if, if we can figure it out, we can calculate things precisely, we can predict with complete accuracy, well, then we're in charge, see? And by definition, therefore, we're not dealing with a person. See, think for a second. Would you use any of those descriptors? Calculating precisely, being completely accurate, figuring it all out. Would you use any of those descriptors in talking about your relationship with your husband, with your wife, with your best friend? No, I mean, that's not how you deal with persons. Instead, you enter into an ever-increasing rapport of trust with such people. Now, raise it to the nth degree, and you have the trust that the Bible is talking about vis-a-vis God. Okay, so what do we learn specifically about faith from our Lord's words today in the Gospel? If you have faith, he says, the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, first implication is most of us have very little faith in God. You know, most of us in this country still believe in God, at least abstractly. They'll tell pollsters that, you know, yes, they they believe that God exists. But see, real faith goes way beyond that kind of vague intellectual assent. It looks like trust and confidence. It looks like, listen now, really turning your life over to God. So, I mean, what's the Lord saying to his disciples? He's saying, well, gosh, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, which means you don't really have much, do you? You don't have this attitude of surrender and trust. You know, one of the most fundamental statements of faith is that your life is not about you. 
you are not in control. This is not your project. Rather, you are part of God's great design. See, friends, listen to me now. To believe this in your bones and to act accordingly is to have faith. So go back to the Lord's statement now. If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could tell this tree to be up, uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. What does he mean now with this you know, typical kind of um, uh, exaggeration? He means that when we operate out of this transformed perspective, amazing things can indeed happen. If we have true faith, true trust, true confidence in God, we have surrendered, as St. Paul put it, to a power already at work in us that can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. You see now, when we're talking about faith, we're not talking about some, some surrender of reason. That's not it at all. What we're talking about is a confident trust in the power of God so that I know this life is not my project. It's not my thing. Rather, it belongs to God. And the more I surrender, the more I surrender, the greater things can happen. Now, this is precisely what we see, don't we, in the lives of the great saints. Think of little Mother Teresa, now St. Teresa of Calcutta, leaving her you know, relatively comfortable life teaching in that school in Calcutta and moving into the worst slum in the world, having nothing, having no material resources, no real money, no institutional support. What did she have? She had faith. She had an attitude of trust. And what's happened because of that? We now have this great order of the missionaries of charity, which stretches all over the world, doing the extraordinary work of God. What that came from was a little mustard seed of trust in the Lord. Think of Francis of Assisi many centuries ago, just abandoning everything. Yes, giving away all his money, even the clothes on his back and walking naked out of town in an attitude of complete abandonment and trust what's happened because of it because of that mustard seed of faith now this great franciscan movement which is stretched across eight centuries of time and stretched all over the world doing the work of the gospel and was born of this confidence think of rose hawthorne one of my favorite of the blesseds who back in the 19th century, when cancer sufferers were rejected from many hospitals, decided simply, and again with no financial support, no institutional structure whatsoever, just to take such sufferers into her own home. What's come of it? Well, now the great Hawthorne Dominican movement. Dominican sisters taking care of those suffering from cancer. Think of St. Anthony. I'll go back many, many centuries. St. Anthony, hearing the gospel call to leave everything and come follow me and, and literally gives away everything he's got and simply wanders into the Egyptian desert to live in total trust and confidence in God. What's come from that little mustard seed of faith but the entire monastic movement in the West. Think of every Benedictine monk Think of every Cistercian, every Trappist monk. Think then ultimately of, of Dominicans, Franciscans, who came in some ways out of that great monastic tradition. It all came from this young kid about the age of 20 who decided to give it all away and live in radical trust in God. How about Maximilian Kolbe? In that prisoner's barracks at Auschwitz, 
when the Nazis had singled out 10 people to be killed and the one man broke down in tears saying, I'm a father of a family. And Kolbe calmly stepping forward and saying, I'm a Catholic priest, take me in his place. What was that born of? Exactly what the Bible calls faith. A trust and confidence in God. What's come from it but a whole explosion of spiritual power. See, so it goes. So it goes in the order of grace. Now, here's a little hint about faith, everybody. Your faith, and again, by that I mean trust, confidence in God, will increase the more you exercise it. It'll increase the more you exercise it. Take a leap. You see, plunge. Take a plunge. It's what the apostles are asking for. You know, Lord, increase our faith. It's probably, I bet, what you're asking for. Well, if you want it to increase, exercise it. Trust. Take the plunge. Have confidence. And you'll find your capacity to trust increasing. Now, let me close with this. It's a curious thing about our reading today. The juxtaposition of this saying about uh, faith and the parable of the unprofitable servant. You know, we know that story well. The servant working hard all day out in the field. The end of the day, he comes in and, and the Lord says, well, he shouldn't expect to receive some kind of reward, but he'll be expected now to serve his master's dinner. And only when he's done with that can he, you know, have his own uh, meal. He receives no particular praise or attention, just the expectation of faithful service. Well, so here's the question. How come these two things are brought together today in the gospel? Well, as is often the case with Jesus' parables that rub us the wrong way, we should pay careful attention to this story, and then we'll figure out why these are linked. See, justice which is rendering to each what is due to him is a good and noble thing. And God is properly described as just. And certainly we ought never to operate in a way that's less than just. Notice, please, how even the smallest children have an instinct for justice, don't they? You know, that's not fair. A little kid will scream and he's never received a formal lesson in the virtue of justice. But they just seem automatically to know what's coming to them. Again, nothing wrong with this. Except now, listen. When justice is your primary consideration, it does mean that, morally speaking, you're still basically in charge. You, as it were, are demanding something of someone else. And again, I'm not bad-mouthing it legitimately. But still, it's your program and you're making the call. I think what Jesus is trying to do in this striking and kind of annoying story is to shake us out of that understanding of our relationship to God. See, because God owes us precisely nothing. Everything we have, including our very existence, is a sheer gift. We're in absolutely no position ever to demand anything of God. See, to move into this space is to claim the moral high ground and to seek to draw God into our world of meaning and value. But this ipso facto is a bad move, spiritually speaking. And so here's the point. No matter what God asks, our proper response is, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've done what I was obliged to do. See, that's the result of an attitude of faith. My life's not about me. My life is an exercise in trusting God. And God bless you.